Good morning, Canopy Roads family and friends. It's good to see you again virtually. It's good to have you with us again. So it's, it's been an exciting time and a ch strange time with this pandemic, but we're excited that we've reached beyond the, the walls of our church and so glad that uh, we're able to do this every week. I wanted to give you a quick report for those in the Canopy Roads Church family, a quick report on our Debt Free in 3 campaign that we call DF3. For those of you who are watching, we just decided uh, a couple years ago that we needed to get out of debt. We, we needed to get out of debt as a church. Instead of spending a lot of money on interest, we can invest that money in ministry and helping people and advancing the gospel and, and doing what God has told us to do. So uh, we made a commitment to get out of debt in three years, and that was two and a half years ago. We started off with $1.3 million, and now, uh, if you can see the little slide, it's, it's kind of small print there, but the, the little blue column on the far right says under $313,000. So uh, if you're at home, Canopy Roads, you can clap and celebrate. This is a pretty pretty cool time. Uh, next month, we'll be below $300,000 and over a million dollars that we've had having paid off uh, during the last two plus years. So we're excited about that. I'll tell you, a lot of people have asked me, what's it like preaching to an empty auditorium? It's weird, okay? It's just weird. There's just nothing I can say about it except it's just strange. It's just odd. It's just weird, you know? I'm standing in here. It's like three or four people in here uh, running the sound or, or the praise band, and I'm looking at empty seats. It's just crazy. Uh, it's so it, it's been a, a, an awkward adjustment, but it's also been exciting to think that actually more people are watching and participating in our services, worshiping, watching the message, and, and, and engaging than ever before, because we, we've been forced to look outside the walls of our church and outside the bounds of our campus, and, that, and that's been a really good thing. This, this, it's been a benefit to this pandemic from our perspective. Now, when we started and we realized, hey, we've got to go all online, we thought, no problem. We've been live streaming for a long time, so it should be great. Well, our first couple messages of uh, worship services really stunk, uh, not because of the quality of what was happening, but because of some, some technical issues that we had. We just didn't realize that we had these issues. They started back in December with the video and audio being out of sync. And we, it took us two weeks to figure that out. It's kind of embarrassing, honestly. We watched it and we're like, this is terrible. I can't believe people are even watching this. So, you know, we just, I have to be real transparent about it. You know, we, we messed up. You know, we didn't know we had this problem. We hadn't been watching that. So the pandemic forced us to really work on the quality of our live streaming and, and what we put out on the Internet. And, and we've improved. Now, we're not there yet. Uh, last week, you know, we, we still had some problems with the, with the sound levels, and we hope we've gotten that largely corrected this week. <laughs> a funny thing that, that came out of last week, uh, a, a couple people have said, you know, I put the cross behind. If you saw the, the Easter video, I put a cross behind me. It had a purple banner on it like, like we do traditionally at Easter, and I had on a purple shirt. And a lot of people have said, looked like he had purple hair, you know, standing right in front of the cross. So, I don't know, just weird stuff happens. Okay, so we can at least have some laughs during this time. Um, our Facebook engagement and views is up over tenfold. I mean, we have had an explosion in the number of people, not only watching, because that's the only thing you can do is watch online, but sharing and commenting and, and liking the videos and invite you to do that again. I'm sure Justin did in his introduction. Like the video, comment, let us know you're here. Say hello to everybody. Uh, that is huge. That helps us get the video out more. And it shows up in people's news feeds more, more frequently. And other people besides people who are watching today have a chance to look at that and engage. So we've, we've found many new friends on Facebook and in the Internet world during this time where we've been you know, just focusing on getting the message out over the internet. So I'd like to especially say welcome to you. We're so glad to have you in our church family. And normally on Sunday morning after worship, we have a big cafe area and, and lobby, and we have a chance to, to get to know and, and meet people. So we don't have that physically, and we can't wait to be able to meet you, particularly if you live in Tallahassee or Havana or this area. But uh, we want to give you a chance today to get better acquainted. We'd love to meet you as a staff. So uh, Pastor Justin and I will be having a, a Facebook live event right after this service for a group of just people who want to meet 
uh, who are not Canopy Roads members, but guests who would like to meet us, and we'd love to meet you. Maybe you have some questions about today's message or, or anything else. We'd just love to engage with you for five or ten minutes. So we're going to post a link at the end of the service that you can join a Facebook group. It's an open Facebook group that you can join, and then we'll be live streaming as soon as, as this service is over. You'll see it in your feed, and you'll be able to, to join us there. We hope you will join us and just hang out with us for a little bit. So I believe the pandemic is really making us better as a church. There's a lot of things that we've looked at and, and, and questioned and, and evaluated. I think it's making us better as a church, and I hope it's making me better as a pastor. We've worked really hard to stay connected with our church family, and we've discovered some things that we can do better and do differently on the other side of this pandemic. So we've seen this as a church staff as an opportunity to learn, to innovate, to grow, and, and hopefully prepare better for the future. So is the pandemic making you better? Or is it making you bitter? Is it, it making you courageous or crazy? Is it making you determined or discouraged, visionary or visionless, persevering or panicked? I mean, we, we can choose how we respond to this pandemic. And I, and I think that's what I want to talk to you today. How we look at this is, is, is really powerful in terms of whether we get crushed by this social distancing and all the things that are happening to us, maybe financially, uh, relationally, or whether we learn from this. So we are, we are one week closer to being out of this, to the pandemic being over, to social distancing being a thing of the past, at least the uh, m- majority, if not all of it. But also, think about it this way, we're one, we have one less week of opportunity to learn how to respond after the pandemic. So it's important that, that we, we adjust our perspective. So today what I want to talk to you about, we're, we're beginning a new series, a four-week series called Navigating Uncertainty. And today I want to begin that by, by talking about how the disciples responded after the resurrection. We think that after the resurrection, then everything was certain. They were, and there were some things that were very certain, but there was a lot of uncertainty as well. So let's pray, and then we'll jump into that. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for this opportunity to gather with uh, our church family and friends, um, really all around the world for that matter, and and come to you in worship and uh, seeking your wisdom and your leadership. And Lord, we just pray that you would give us insight into how to respond to these unprecedented times, how to to deal with the uncertainty that, that people are feeling. And I know that there's a wide variety of responses and experiences in the listening audience, Lord, there's some people who are really being crushed by this. They've lost their jobs, their businesses are closed. They don't know how or when or if they'll be able to reopen. There are others who have lost loved ones uh, to the coronavirus. There there are people who are struggling with just the the panic of being inside all the time, and there are people who have loved ones in senior facilities. They can't see them, and Lord, there's there's a lot of anxiety and stress and uncertainty in this environment. So, Lord, we just pray that you'd speak into that today with clarity and, uh, and give us encouragement and a sense of direction of how to deal with this. In Jesus' name, amen. So, let's go back right where we picked up, where we left off last week after Easter Sunday with the resurrection. You know, the disciples had witnessed the crucifixion. They were crushed. They couldn't believe that the Messiah that they had followed for three years was dead. Uh, he didn't fight. He didn't, he didn't resist the authorities. When they knew that anyone who could heal people, who could feed 5,000 people from a kid's lunch, who could walk on water, who could calm the seas, he could do anything. They, didn't, they couldn't do to him what they did unless he allowed it. So they're crushed. They're confused. And then Jesus shows up, and the king is back, and everything is great. They're pumped up. They're fired up. And then he's gone again. So he makes his appearances off and on over 40 days. He's here, and they're excited, and then he's gone, and they're confused. So there, there's still uncertainty after the resurrection. They know that he is God. They know that, that he has come alive from the dead. He's defeated sin. He's defeated death. But what's next? He's not here all the time. So does that mean he's not going to be here for a long time? They, they were confused. It was, a, it was a time of great uncertainty. I heard a great quote a couple weeks ago. One of our members, Ricky Harper, is a member of a group called C12. Uh, they, they coach and, 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 and have peer mentoring with, uh, with 
business owners who are Christians who want to grow their business and grow their influence in, in the community for Christ. And the CEO of the C12 group, Mike Shero, said this, you don't fight uncertainty with certainty. You fight it with clarity. You don't fight uncertainty with certainty. You fight it with clarity. Now, don't misunderstand me. Certainty is important for a Christ follower. We can be certain that God is sovereign even when things are out of control or look to be out of control from our perspective. We can be certain about the resurrection. Jesus really did rise from the dead. He is our Savior. He really can save people from their sins and change our destiny and guarantee us an eternity in heaven. The disciples knew that Jesus was real, that he really was God, but they didn't know what to do. They were still uncertain. They, they knew that when they died, they would go to heaven, but they didn't know what to do now. They needed clarity. You see, certainty about God, about the scriptures, about a relationship with Christ can give us hope, can give us courage. It can help us not to panic. It can help us to control our fears in times of uncertainty, but it doesn't tell us what to do or where to go. They needed clarity. So here's the big idea I want to unpack for you today. In times of uncertainty, clarify your mission and vision. In times of uncertainty, clarify your mission and vision. What you're trying to accomplish and where you want to go in the future. And let's look at how Jesus did that with his disciples. Numerous post-resurrection appearances helped him to define or clarify the mission. It, it hadn't changed, but it helped them to clarify it post-resurrection and also to give them a clear vision of where they should be going in the future. John twenty twenty one, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. He says, I'm sending you on the mission, the same mission that the Father sent me on to reach the world for Christ with the good news of the gospel. Their mission was his mission. His mission is my mission. His mission is your mission if you're a follower of Jesus. Jesus brought them more clarity about what their mission was. It's the same mission that he had. Then in another resurrection appearance at the end of Matthew, a very familiar passage, he says in Matthew 28, beginning with verse 18, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In other words, I am who you thought I was, who I said I was, and I have the authority to direct your lives. I have the authority to see the future and tell you what you should be doing now and what you can be doing in the future. Therefore, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, that's a clear mission. Did you get it? Go make disciples. That's what the mission was. That's what their mission was today, tomorrow, next week, next year, and for the rest of their lives, to make disciples. Now, what's the relevance for navigating uncertainty in the pandemic? Mission answers the what question. What am I trying to accomplish? What am I trying to accomplish with my life? What am I trying to accomplish in my family? What am I trying to accomplish in the lives of my kids? What am I trying to accomplish in my career? What am I trying to accomplish in ministry? What is my mission? Every one of us should have a clear understanding of what our mission is in, in all the major areas of our lives. What are we trying to accomplish? What are we trying to accomplish in our education? There's a mission that you have. A pandemic and any other crisis can change a lot of things, but it doesn't change your mission. It didn't change Jesus' mission. It didn't change his mission for the disciples. It doesn't change your mission. If you know what your mission is, the mission is still the same in this pandemic. Now, mission is not the same as vision, and you need to understand both. I'm going to spend the bulk of our time on, on vision. 
Mission answers the what question. What am I supposed to accomplish? Or what am I trying to accomplish? Vision answers the where question. Where am I going in the future? Where are we going in the future? Vision answers the where question. Vision is a destination. It's a picture of a favorable future. Where you want to be five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road. Where do you want to be? Have you thought about that? Maybe if you've had an interview in the last four or five years, somebody has asked you that. Where do you see yourself in five years? We need to be thinking about that. We need to have an idea of where we want to end up five years, 10 years, 20 years from now. Where do you want your family to be? Where do you want, if, if you're married, where do you want your marriage to be? If you're single, where do you want to be relationally in the, in the next 20 years? Where do you want to be in your career, your business, if you own your own business? You see, vision is something we're willing to sacrifice for. Vision is something we're willing to work hard for. Vision inspires us. It motivates us. It propels us forward because we know this is where I want to be. So I can deal with uncertainty. I can deal with problems. I can deal with stress. I can deal with hard times. If I know that's where I'm going, it's worth it. So in Jesus' last appearance with the disciples, he clarified their vision. We find this in Acts chapter 1. We'll start with verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, the disciples don't quite get it yet. They still think that Jesus is going to restore the political prominence and, and the prestige of the Hebrew people. They're going to throw off the rope of Roman oppression, and they're going to be, once again, the, the, the premier leader in the world, and they're going to be the, advancing the, the Jewish faith. Is this when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But listen to this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You see the vision? What question does vision answer? Vision answers the where question. Do you see the where in this verse? Where was following Jesus going to take them? It was going to take them first, starting in Jerusalem, they would plant a church. They would plant the, the ministry of Jesus in Jerusalem, but it wouldn't end there. It would extend to Judea, which was the Roman province that, where, uh, that Jerusalem was capital of, so to speak. And then Samaria, the adjoining province, that's like going from Florida to Georgia and Alabama, and then to the ends of the earth. So his vision was to spread the gospel around the whole world. The mission was to make disciples in each of those places. However, they, they did that. And the, 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 the vision was clarified later to plant churches. Plant churches here in Jerusalem and then the rest of Judea and then Samaria and, and surrounding provinces and on to the rest of the world. Notice also, when God clarifies your vision, he also gives you special power to pursue it. He promised these disciples, look, here's the vision. But he'd already told them, go back to Jerusalem. Before he told them this, go back to Jerusalem, wait till you receive power. He says, you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the remotest part of the earth. So, God was promising power. He was promising to give them special abilities to accomplish this vision. He was going to give them special courage to deal with uncertainty and, and, and oppression and problems they would have. He was going to give them increased faith in him and confidence during this time. He was also going to give them what the scripture calls the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those, those character qualities that, that should characterize the life of every believer. When we're pursuing the mission of Jesus, he gives us special power to do that. Pursuing the mission of Jesus in your life, in your family, in your career, in your education, in all these areas that we mentioned earlier. When God clarifies your vision, he gives you special power to, to pull it off. 
Vision clarifies your destination, so it keeps you on course when you encounter uncertainty. Do, do you get that? Well, let me, let me give you an example. Let's say that post-pandemic, or maybe pre-pandemic, you plan to go to Disney World. I know several of you were planning to go. You, you had a plan to go to Disney World. Let's say in normal times you're doing that, and on the way, you have a flat tire. What do you say? Well, there goes our Disney trip. We had a flat tire. We can't get there. No, that's not what you do. You fix the flat. Sometimes it could be really inconvenient. You have to go to a tire store and get a whole new tire. You may be somewhere stranded on I-10 or I-75, but you don't just shelve the Disney trip because you had a period of uncertainty. We don't know what to do about this tire. You know, we don't have a spare or whatever it might be, whatever it could have caused. The vision, the destination is still the same. It's Disney. Are you with me? When you have a clear vision of the future, you know where you want to go. So when you encounter a period of uncertainty or crisis or problem, it doesn't scrap the vision. It just, it's just an inconvenience. It's something you have to navigate in. And you may even learn something during that time that will help you in the future when you have problems like that or help you clarify your vision. Do we really want to go to Disney? So... Those kind of things help you. So when you have a vision, it clarifies your destination so you know what to do in times of uncertainty. I, I love what uh, church vision consultant Will Mancini says. He says, every picture contains three horizons of vision. Every picture contains three horizons. Now think about this uh, as someone taking a selfie. So when you take a selfie and you, you take the picture, and then you look at the selfie, you see there's, in the foreground, there's whoever's being photographed, right? Okay? And then behind them, off in the distance, we call that the mid-ground, you see other, other elements back there. And then way off in the distance, you can see the edge of the picture. If it's outside, it's like the horizon. So there are three different levels of vision. There's the, there's the foreground, the mid-ground, and the background. Now think about vision in the same way. Vision as a future picture, in other words. And, and this, again, is from Will Mancini in his book called God Dreams. Vision as a, as a future picture. Think about vision as that picture that's way out there. And even beyond the horizon. Let's begin with that. What's beyond the horizon? Because if you head out to go to Disney World from Tallahassee, you can't see uh, Kissimmee from here, right? You, you can't see Mickey's ears. You can't, you can't see that. So that's beyond the horizon. But you know where you want to go. And you have a picture of where you want to be. The same is true for your life. Beyond the horizon, let's call that 5 to 20 years. Where do you want to be 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? That's beyond the horizon. You can't see there now. But if you gain a vision, you can have a picture in your mind and in your heart of this is where I want to be. And God will give you that sense of where he wants you to be. Then there's a background vision. That's like, as far as you can see now, let's say three years. And, and with a three-year vision, what you need to do with a three-year vision is things you want to accomplish or places you want to be in three years that will help you end up where you want to be ultimately in five to 20 years. Does that make sense? So, and, and then there's a mid-ground vision. Let's call that one year. And what you want to accomplish in one year, where you want to be a year from now, is somewhere that will help you to accomplish your three-year vision, which is designed to help you accomplish and make progress toward your five- to 20-year vision. So then there's the foreground vision. So you got the Beyond the horizon, the background, the midground, and the foreground vision. The foreground vision, let's just call that the next 90 days. What do I need to do in the next 90 days so that over the next year, I will be where my one-year vision was? So that at the end of that year, I will be making progress toward my three-year vision and then in turn toward the five- and 20-year vision. Where's the pandemic in this picture? That's right. It's in the next 90 days. In the next 90 days, we will largely be out of this pandemic it, unless it flares up again. And, but certainly within a year. 
So if the pandemic is in the next 90 days, it's not going to change where you end up 5 to 20 years from now. It might change how you get there and when you get there, but it doesn't change that you get there. For example, let's say you're married and you have kids, and you, you have a vision for what you want your marriage to be 20 years from now. You have a vision for what, where you want your kids to be and what you want them to be like and what you want them to accomplish and their character and their, their commitment to Christ and, and whatever, whatever your vision is. But let's suppose that right now you're having a difficult time in your marriage. You're fighting or there's been a breach of trust. And you don't know how to deal with that. You may even be to the point where you're considering divorce. You feel like the fracture in our marriage is so great, I can't possibly re reconcile myself to this. I can't trust him again. I can't trust her again, wh whatever the situation is. Uh, or, or maybe you're in a situation where your, your marriage is just stressed and, and your kids' schedules are just driving you nuts because you're always hauling them here, there, and yonder, and you're just overbooked, overscheduled, and your budget is stretched to the limit because of all that. And your kids are out of control. What, would, what do you need to do in the next 90 days to address that? Well, some things that you might do is you might pursue some marriage counseling. That'd be a good idea. You might um, read a book on relationships or watch some videos on marriage counseling or, or, or something to improve your marriage. You might decide, hey, we need to, we need to clear some things off our calendar. Our, our lives are just too busy, and that's why we're so upset with each other and stressed. We've got too many things going on. Or maybe your finances are so stressed. Maybe that's what the problem is. This is underlying current of uncertainty and stress in your finances, and you fight about that all the time. And you just don't feel close to your kids. For some reason, you were close when they were little, and now they're just bigger, and they just, you just don't feel close to them anymore. Well, what would happen if in the next 90 days you enter a period where you're no longer working away from home. You actually have to work at home. And all the events in your lives are basically, all the social events are basically canceled. And, and you're, a lot of your expenses have been kind of wiped out because you're not having to spend money on this, that, and the other because those events are canceled. And you're now having every meal together as a family, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and a month ago, you would have thought, that's crazy. We never do that. We hardly ever have a meal together. Now you're having three meals a day together. <laughs> and that was a prescription for accomplishing your vision. Does that give you a little different perspective about what may be happening in this pandemic and how the pandemic could actually be something that helps you accomplish your vision? When are you ever going to have a time to look at your family life with a clean slate? To decide, okay, we're going to put fewer things back on the plate. We're going to add fewer things back into our budget. Man, we've got time to make a budget now. You see, if you know where you're going, where you want to go, you can look at the current 90-day situation, whatever it is now, and in the future, you're going to have crises and uncertainties. Don't, it's not just going to be pandemics. But it doesn't have to crush you. When you know where you want to go, it helps you propel through this period of, of uncertainty. Let's go back to the disciples. After Jesus said, uh, you'll be my after you, you receive power, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. That was the vision. And you're, I'm going to give you power to do it. And then Jesus ascended into heaven and he was gone. He was gone. He wasn't coming back until the end of time. Verse 9 of Acts 8 says that when they had seen these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Well, what happened after that? Well, for the next 10 days, they went into Jerusalem and they just prayed. And the whole time they were asking God, God, what do you want us to do? Where do you want us to go? We, you know, we, they, they remembered we're supposed to make disciples, 
He wants to go Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, end of the earth. I mean, it's hard for him to even think about end of the earth at that time. I mean, what do we need to do now? Ten days after that, the Holy Spirit shows up in a special way and gives them special abilities, boldness and power, and they start sharing the gospel. And 3,000 people become believers and followers of Jesus the first day of the the church, the the opening day of the church. 3,000 people came into the church. So the church explodes from about 120 who were, in, who were together prior to that to 3,120 in one day. It's amazing. And then there was a time where, where Peter and, and John were walking in the temple and there was this poor beggar there that uh, asked them, you know, looked up at them as if to say, could you give me something, uh, some, some money, some, some help here? I'm just a poor beggar. And uh, you, maybe you remember this story. Peter says, uh, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus. Stand up and walk. And he, he was healed. And people just, just thronged them and wanted to know more. And the, and the chief priests and the elders who had crucified Jesus got upset about this. And they brought Peter and John before them and said, what are you doing? You can't talk anymore in the name of Jesus. They threatened them. And, of course, Peter and John probably thought, you know, we may end up on a cross just like Jesus. Here's what they prayed after they were released. And now, Lord, look upon their threats, the threats of these people who said, don't do this anymore in the name of Jesus. Grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. They didn't dwell on the uncertainty. They knew what their vision was. Their vision was to share the gospel and to plant churches in Jerusalem and outside Jerusalem and outside the country of the nation of Israel and and around the world. So give us boldness. That's just amazing. It's like, Lord, now consider this pandemic, but grant to us, your servants, the courage and the boldness to pursue the vision you've given us. That's what the disciples did. So don't dwell on uncertainty. Dwell on the vision. We need to deal with our uncertainty. We need to deal with the conditions that the pandemic is causing. And like I said earlier, I know that this is catastrophic in some of your lives. I I don't minimize that at all. This is no minor crisis. For some of you, it's more of an inconvenience. For others, it's catastrophic. But if you have a clear picture of what your mission is in life and what your vision is in the future, you can navigate this uncertain time with clarity because you are clear about where you're going if you don't have a mission and vision spend some time with Jesus and maybe you've been watching this for the last couple weeks or maybe this is your first time and you you know you don't really have a relationship with God through Jesus you're not a Christ follower Jesus can change your life. He can change it now. He wants to give us, give you forgiveness. He wants to bring restoration to you through his redemptive power to forgive you and, uh, and offer you the gift of salvation and eternal life in heaven. But he also wants to give you a mission, a vision now. Wouldn't you like to have that? You can receive the Lord Jesus today. And become one of his followers. And get on the road to discovering what his mission is for you. And what his vision is for your life. For your relationships. For your business. For your career. Every area of your life. In addition to giving you a guarantee of a destiny in heaven. He can give you courage and confidence and clarity about what to do now. If that's what you would like, I invite you to join me in prayer and you ask Jesus to come into your life. Tell him you want to be one of his followers. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you proved that you really are who you said you were. You were God in the flesh, 100% God. You had power over death, over sin, over the grave. And Lord, you prove that by your resurrection. So you have the authority to speak into our lives. You have the authority to offer us forgiveness and eternal life. You have the authority to give us a mission and a vision that matters. So I pray for that person right now who wants to have a relationship with you. 
Maybe they're reaffirming a relationship from the past and they're kind of coming home, so to speak. Maybe this is a first-time commitment. But if that's you, would you just tell Jesus right now, just pray with me, dear Jesus, I want to have a personal relationship with you. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my life. I believe that you gave your life for my sins on the cross, and I believe that you rose from the dead. So I want to become one of your followers. Give me confidence, Lord, that I'm a child of God beginning right now today. And give me clarity about the mission and the vision that you have for my life. I want to pursue you with a passion. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, we would love to hear from you. Let us know that you have become a follower of Jesus. In fact, I'd invite you to join us in the pastor's lounge uh, just to, uh, right after the end of this, this time. And uh, there, there'll be a link in the stream. Uh, there'll be a comment there from, uh, from Canopy Roads. You click on that link and it'll automatically put you in that group. And you can just hang out with us for a little bit. And, uh, and then we'll be live right after this. And you can engage. You can, you can ask some questions if you want to. You can just sit there and watch and listen. Uh, we'd love to introduce ourselves uh, as pastors and, and get better acquainted. So we hope you'll join us in that. We'll look forward to that. Uh, we're also going to have a time of worship now. And uh, also, by the way, I forgot to mention that uh, if you have prayer needs, we, we consider it an honor to be your prayer partner. So if you'll just email us, this goes from members um, and guests alike, just email us at prayforme at canopyroads.org. Prayforme at canopyroads.org. We check that regularly, and uh, we'll pray for your prayer need. We consider it an honor to be your prayer partner.